Thank you. Subject to change by the Holy Ghost is our service every Sunday. I want to do something a little different. Two things happened. Our brother Chick, who works in the hospital, had to be taken to the emergency room last evening because he ate some seafood that gave him a terrible allergic reaction that he's still struggling with but coming out of. And uh, our sister Eulor here lost her auntie yesterday who was like her mother, made a promise to her mother that she would watch after her after her mother was gone. And her auntie went on to be with the Lord yesterday. And as I was talking to her, I learned that her auntie was so concerned about her. And she looks all grown up to me. But her auntie was concerned about her and what was going to happen with her. Brother Sean, thank you so much for stopping by to help us in the middle of your work day. So I want to ask you, Laura, to come, Pastor Christopher, if you would come also and lay hands on her. And we're going to pray for her. We're also going to pray for Brother Chick, who was not with us. greater than you, Lord. We thank you for that. Oh, we sang all about that this morning. But Lord, they're not just songs to us. We will be those praise. You reign and there is nobody greater than you. And you deserve every bit of our praise, oh God. We had to put that prayer that you would lead us to the cross, oh Lord. And sometimes the cross does seem very heavy to us. But we thank you, oh God, that there is nothing that we can bear that you're not there helping us with it. We thank you for our sister, you are, Lord, and that this, this whole thing and this passing from life to life for her mind is, is putting her in a place of major transition, oh God. And I can just pray, oh Lord, that you would give her wisdom, that you would give her that peace of God that passes all understanding, oh Lord, that let this mind, that you would help her to let this mind that be in Christ be also in her mind, oh Lord. And we understand what that means. We understand that you left glory and that you came in the form of a human being and that you had a mind of loneliness and humility and that you were meek, oh God, but you were strong as well, oh Lord. So we pray this for her, oh God. Oh, Lord. 
Lord, that you are leading and guiding her. Open up her ears that she may hear you more clearly. Silence all other voices. In this place of sensitivity, oh God, other voices try to speak. The voices of other people, the voices of the devil, and her own voice. But let her hear the most important voice of all.
Almighty God, we thank you. To you, all the glory belongs. We ascribe to you the glory, the majesty, the power, dominion. You are the God who is altogether lovely. You are the lily in every one of our valleys. You are the bright and morning star that shines into our darkness, O oh Lord. You are our shepherd who always leads us and guides us. You are the perfect and holy God. And we honor you today and say thank you. To you be all the glory and all the honor. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, I praise God that you are here on this Palm Sunday to remember the start of Holy Week and where Jesus was. And we're going to walk along that path today. And the title of our message today is Jesus the King. He indeed is the king. He was the king. He is the king. He'll always be the king. There won't be any greater than he. He is the king over every king. And we're looking in the book of Matthew today, chapter 21, where Pastor Christopher already read in our hearing those words. The book of Matthew is all about God's saving act in Jesus Christ, that how he sent Jesus into the world in the form of a baby, in the form of a human being, and he used him to save the world. Matthew has written to us that we may have a greater understanding of God. Oftentimes we uh, hear people say, oh yes, I, I know God, but do we really know God? Matthew has written for us so that we would gain a greater understanding of who this God is. He has written that we would have a greater understanding of the kingdom of God. Those of you who are uh, understanding God's kingdom know that an aspect of the kingdom of God is his system of management by which he governs and controls every thing that he has made. Oftentimes people say that, oh, God is not in control because they're looking at things that are happening in the earth. But what they don't understand is that God has put systems in order that keep this world going. He has put laws in the kingdom by which we are to live. If we break the laws of the kingdom, we end up in the penalty box of life. But if we are in keeping with the laws and abide by the laws of the Lord, then we live on the reward side of life. But Matthew wants to help us to understand the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of Satan. He wants us to have a greater understanding of the life and the ministry ministry and the work of Jesus Christ at Calvary, his resurrection. He, he, he wants us to understand the church and history and the fulfillment of the end of the age as, as theologians and scholars call the eschatology. He wants us to understand where this age is going. He wants us to understand things about ethics and about law and about discipleship. That's why Matthew wrote all of these theological themes are in the book of Matthew. There's a lot there to study and our having this book connects us with that ancient Christian community to which Matthew had written in that it gives us a bird's eye view into the events of their day, particularly the event that we're addressing today, this triumphal entry into Jerusalem by Jesus and it helps us to draw a parallel between that biblical event and our contemporary situations on a personal level because we can read all of this about Jesus coming into Jerusalem, riding in, and this what is called triumphal uh, entry into Jerusalem, but what does that have to do with me right down on a personal level where I live? How can that help me with my situation, my challenges in life, my joys? How can it help me to be able to look at life and perceive correctly? So we start with verses 1 through 3, and we look at them. It says, now when they drew near, reading from the New King James, 
When they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village opposite you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone asks anything, if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them and immediately he will send them. You see, Jesus gives two disciples very specific instructions. In the John account, it says, and after he said this, and what was it that Jesus said? He was just talking to them in parable language, and he had just said to them, he who has even more shall be given, and he, and he shall have an abundance, but he who has not, even that which he has shall be taken from him. What John was trying to explain that Jesus was saying is that there is a level of having that all of us must have. There's a level that you have to be at and if you're not there you begin to lose. You have to be at a certain level for your health, for your economy, friends. The Bible says if you want friends, you got to show yourself friendly. You can't walk around looking like you're sucking on a lemon and expect people to want to be friendly with you. And then from that conversation, it says that he began to draw near to Jerusalem after giving them that parable, that lesson. And now Jesus is giving his disciples, two of them, two of them, very specific instructions. You see, in those days, royal emissaries could demand the service of an animal temporarily. I don't know if you ever saw movies of uh, cops or police officers, I should say, chasing a criminal and somehow or another the police car gets wrecked up and, and then they jump out and then they hold up their badge to a, a driver and say, I need your vehicle. And then they, you know, the driver gets out and the police officer gets in and takes off in that car after the criminal. Now, the only difference here is that you notice that Jesus says here what he, they were to tell them. The Lord has need of them and immediately he will send them. And what he's saying is that I'm going to send them back. I'm only, I'm only borrowing and I'm not trying to keep them. The only difference between that and the story of the police officer is that when you get your vehicle back, that's if you get your vehicle, vehicle back, it's usually all crashed up. Okay? But see, in this instance, I'm going to give them back to you like you gave them to me. And so... Royal emissaries could demand the use or the service of an animal or anything that anybody had temporarily. And Jesus, as king and lord, had the right to ask his followers of anything that they claimed to own. And Jesus knew that the donkey's owner would probably see it as an act of hospitality and, and a way of honoring this famous rabbi by helping him with the loan of his animal. Now, I, I, I need to say to you that Matthew is the only one of the other three, Luke and John and Mark, that say that there were two animals. And scholars would say that it was one animal spoken of in two different kinds of ways. But whatever it is between all of that, we know one thing. Jesus went into Jerusalem that day riding on a donkey. So the instructions that Jesus gave these two disciples were based on a prophecy about Jesus that we find in Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9. And this is what it says. It's written here in verses 4 and 5 when Matthew is saying to us all of this was done. What, the, what is the this that was done? The going and asking for the donkey. All of this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets saying, tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. That's from Zechariah 9. You see, Matthew citing this scripture from Zechariah was fundamental to him helping you and me understand this whole event 
of Jesus coming into Jerusalem on this donkey. He wants to make sure that Jesus is perceived by us as that humble, as that gentle king. In so doing, he redefines kingship for us. You see, when we think about kingship, we think about somebody coming with royal robes in a royal chariot drawn by royal horses and all this pomp and circumstance. But Matthew redefines kingship for us based on who Jesus was. You see, a king was born, but the birth of a king King in that event as we see it the birth of was redefined for us because where was he born in a stable in a trough that was filled with hay to make things comfortable for us so Matthew continues that theme from his birth to this point in which he's coming in as a king but he redefines kingship for us in verses 6 to 8, it says, So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the coat, laid their clothes on them, and set him, him who, Jesus, on them. On what? On the clothes, on the donkey. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. What do we see here? We see that the disciples did what Jesus ordered them to do. Didn't turn around and say, well, wait, wait a minute, Jesus. Okay, now you want us to go over there to these strange people and you want us to bring these animals back to you. Okay, uh, uh, do they know we're coming? Well, the scripture doesn't tell us that he gave them any argument. They just went and did what Jesus told them to do. They brought the donkey and the coat Colt laid their clothes on them. They made a sort of a saddle for Jesus to ride on, if you will, okay? By using their clothes on the back, they made a saddle for him. The NIV, NIV says, and Jesus sat on them. And as I was doing my study, I found that this was a very important statement, that, that he sat on them. And the reason why this is an important statement sat on them, those three words, is because of the tense. You know, when I'm talking about tense, you know, you know about past tense and future tense and, and present tense. Well, this is a, an, an aorist tense. Uh, it, it's a, a Greek tense, okay? But I just want to tell you what it means. The tense that is used here Within the context, the context is important. The tense all by itself really doesn't have any meaning. But within this particular context says to us that this action that Jesus took is something that is happening only in this moment in time where he sat on this animal. It's only happening at this moment, at this point in time. You will never see this again. It's happening now. You're not going to see, and you didn't see Jesus, and you're not going to see Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. It happens now. That's how life is. There are things that only happen in this point in time. They don't ever happen again. He didn't come riding a war horse like a great warrior. Kings usually rode into cities as great conquerors riding on horses, but not Jesus, not him. He rode in on a colt, which is a symbol of peace. And the next time we see him riding anything, the next time we see him riding anything, it will be as a conquering king on a white horse, as it tells us in Revelation 19. You see, scholars tell us that, the, that most of these people, the people that were spreading their clothes and, and, and the branches, most of them were from Galilee, and they were familiar with Jesus. They knew Jesus. They had witnessed his many miracles. And many in the great crowd were there because of the raising of Lazarus. Oh, he's the man that raised Lazarus from the dead. So they were there. 
and the branches that they were had strewn across the road, those branches are associated with rejoicing and with expressions of triumph and victory. And I, and I know that it's called Jesus' triumphal uh, entry into Jerusalem, but when you look at the times, it would not, have been a, would not have been considered a triumphal entry. Not compared to the way the Romans would have come in with all this pomp and circumstance. But when you're able to, as, as I love Dr. Eve say, see with a second set of eyes, you can see how triumphal this entry really is. Because it is introducing a king to the people. It was usual to strew flowers and branches and, and spread carpets and garments in the pathway of conquerors and great princes and others to whom it was intended to show a particular honor and respect. That was the usual thing. And in a similar way, <coughs> you may remember Jehu in the Old Testament. David was king. Solomon was to be king next. Jehu was his right hand man, his main warrior out there. He was a great conqueror. And he decided that he was going to be king. And we find it in 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 13, that they had strewn and put their clothes on the ground for him to walk on and say, Jehu is king. So they thought. How do we see this in modern times? You know, when a bride is going down the aisle, you, you have the little flower girl, and what's she doing? She is sprinkling rose petals or flower petals all along the path as a way of honoring her, the bride who was coming behind her. She walks on those petals. It's the same kind of idea when you have important and powerful and famous people. What do they do? They roll out the red carpet for them. As a matter of fact, when they have these uh, uh, award ceremonies and everything, that they talk about uh, who's walking on the red carpet. It would be those of, of importance and those who are very famous. And then sometimes we talk about, oh, they got the red carpet treatment. It means that they were treated particularly well. Then we go to verse 9, and it says, Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Oh, boy, where did we hear that before? At the birth of Jesus. Hallelujah. This is is a royal acclamation that the people are making of him. They were looking for God's restoration of Israel, for God through Jesus Christ to deliver them uh, from the oppression of the Romans. But he will not come with justice and victory until he returns again, riding on that white horse as it tells us in Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 to 21. But they were looking for it then. Verses 10 and 11 say, And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. They didn't call him a king. They said he is the prophet. And they were right in saying that as well. You see, throughout Jesus' ministry, he pretty much avoided Jerusalem. So the people there didn't really know him. And when it says all the city was moved, what it's saying is that they were so shaken by this parade that's going by. They didn't know what was going on. I mean, they lived there under Roman rule. Anything could be happening. And so they were shaken by this whole thing. It was as though an earthquake had happened and, and stirred them all up. That's how shaken they were. They were quite alarmed when they asked, well, who, who is he? Who is that? 
They wanted to know who would draw such attention as this. And it kind of puts you in the mind of when Jesus asked them, well, like, who, who do men say that I am? And now they're saying, who, who is this that's causing such a great stir in the city? You see, Luke also records that on this day, some of you may remember, that when Jesus came into the city, he looked out over the city and he wept. He wept. Luke chapter 19. I want you to turn there for me. Luke chapter 19. Nineteen verses forty one and forty two. And what does it say? Now, as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. You see? He wept because there was a window of opportunity for the people of Israel, and they missed it. They didn't see it. So let's, let's look back at where we've been. In verses 1 through 3, we see Jesus give specific instructions, and he expressed a need for something that he will return. You see, as we're going through life every day, every day God is giving you specific instructions. Something that he's telling you to do, not something that's debatable, not something that he even wants to negotiate with you. He is giving you something specifically to do because he planned your life and my life out before the foundation of the world. Before he created the world, he had you and me in mind and he planned our lives out. And so when he gives us instructions, they're not for us to debate or negotiate because he knows all. He is omniscient. He knows the direction that we're going in or at least the direction that we should be going in if we are yielded to him. And then he asked us for something. Oh, when we gave our lives to him and said, Lord, I give my life to you, he took it and he kept it and he doesn't let it go. Oh, we wiggle and we, you know, shake and we try to get loose sometimes, but he doesn't let us go. We try to go off on our own way, you know, because we accept the Jesus at 7 or 10 or 9 or 8 or 11 years old, and then we get old enough and we get in college, and then we decide, oh, I'm going to do my own thing and I'm going to try to wriggle out of this hole. He doesn't let us go. <clears throat> And he asks us for something. And he says to us, if you give it to me, I'll give it back to you better than you gave it to me. I want something for you. I have need of you. If you give me your life, if you give me your whole life, as Maria Durso would say, I'm going to give you a whole life. He makes us whole. Oh, we come to him fragmented. But with all of our fragments, with all of our pieces, with all of our brokenness, with all of our woundedness, we come and we bring it all to him. And he puts us together and makes us whole gives us a whole life. In verses 4 and 5 we see that there is a prophecy that's connected with the instructions that provides for the reason for the instructions. You see God has spoken a prophetic word over your life. He has spoken things about you and about what you are to be in this life and he gives instructions based on that prophecy. You see God has a plan. God is not trying to figure things out along the way. God set this plan out, and he sees, okay, there's the plan for you, Lars, life. There's Re the plan for Reverend Carlisle's life. There, there's the plan. Now, I'm going to give her instructions at this particular point in time because they are based on 
the plan that has already been spoken over her life. Now, all she needs to do is do what I tell her in this moment in time because it's all a part of the plan. She's got to stay on that continuum and do what I've instructed her to do here, that the prophetic word that I've already spoken to her life would come to fruition. Our obedience is critical. Critical. We don't see it. We don't see it. God sees it. He sees our end from the beginning. We don't see it. And so we don't know when he instructs us to do this here. And it sounds so silly what he's telling us to do. It just doesn't make sense what he's telling us to do. But we don't know that if we don't do it, it's going to interrupt the flow on this continuum. And could indeed cause us to miss our window of opportunity. As Jesus had said in the King James uh, version, I would have gathered you as a hen gathers her chicks, but you would not. And he was letting them know you have missed your window of opportunity. You have missed your visitation. You have missed a Kairos moment. And a Kairos moment is not like Kronos. Kronos is we look at our time and we see what time it is. Kairos is a moment in time. That when it comes and that window opens, you take the opportunity because when that window closes, it's over. <clears throat> In verses 6 and 7, we see the obedience of the disciples and their preparation for this ride that Jesus takes, which will never be seen again. And Pastor was talking earlier today about preparing the way, about how John came. And they said, well, who are you? You know, are, are you the Messiah? Are you Elijah? Oh, you no, know, who are you? Uh, he's like, I'm not any of those. He said, I am the voice crying in the, in the wilderness, prepare you the way for the Lord. They were making preparation for his entry. And see, we have to make preparation for God's entry through us into the lives of others. And he is preparing us when we yield to him. He is preparing us that we would be in a place so that when we confront or when we meet with someone, he can have a triumphal entry into their lives. Where they would be at a position to say, save me now, Lord. Hosanna. Save me now. You see, over the years, up into this New Testament period, the word Hosanna had lost some of its significance. But from the Old Testament, you know, in the New Testament, it was this praise thing. But in the Old Testament, it said, Lord, save now. Yes. And we, as we allow the Lord to prepare, as we prepare ourselves by yielding ourselves to the Lord, then we allow him through us to make that triumphal entry into somebody else's life that they may be saved. In verse 8, we see how they give Jesus the red carpet treatment. And the Lord wants to give us the red carpet treatment as we move through this work. Earth, the, the, the scripture says to us, go into all of the world and make disciples. And what it's saying to you and to me is, as you go. You see, you're going in a way that I'm not going. I'm going in a way that you're not going. But we're all going so with the hope that we'll cover the whole earth, as the scripture says, and his glory covers the whole earth because his glory is within us, that as we go, we can make disciples. <laughs> In verse 9, you see how they recognize Jesus as king coming from the line of David and how they expect them, him to save them from the oppression that they have been under as a result of the Romans ruling over them, they give him the same praise that was afforded him by the angels when he was born. The same thing. Glory to God in the highest, they said, when he was born. The angels. And now the people are saying the same thing about him. That's what we want. We want to be able to present God in such a way as we go in this world that people will rejoice and recognize that he is the son of David, he is the son of God, that he is God. 
and that we can rejoice. From verses 6 to 9, we see a parallel between the way in which Jesus entered this world and when he was born and the way in which he is leaving this world, starting with this triumphal entry into Jerusalem. He came humbly into this world. He is entering as a king humbly and meekly into Jerusalem before his death. In verses 10 and 11, we are told that the city was moved because of the great stir provoked by Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. But John tells us that Jesus was moved as well, so much that he wept over the city because he realized they didn't get it. They're about to miss their visitation. They don't, they don't recognize who he is or even what's going on. They had been offered something that was only available at a point in time, and they missed it. They rejected it. They saw it, but they didn't know what they were looking at. And so it is with us. The Lord is coming, has come. He meets us. Do we see him? He speaks to us. Do we hear him? He has instructed us. He has given us things to do. He has told us who we are to be. I often say that whatever you do comes out of who you are. You must be first. You have to be first. Being comes before doing. You see, if you're a wretched soul and that's who you are, then what you do is going to come out of what you are. Wretchedness is going to come out of that. But if you're holy and righteous and living for God, if that's who you be, if you will allow me to put it that way, then what you do is going to come out of that. If you're all about love, if that's who you are, if that's all wrapped up in your being, then love is going to be a part of everything that you do. You're doing, you're talking. Your acting is all going to be about love. Why? Because that's who you are. Your doing comes out of your being. So be who God called you to be. And don't miss your hour of visitation when he shows up. The Lord is merciful, but there are certain things that will happen only in this time and never again. And the thing about it is that when God tells us to do this right here, right now, if we don't do it, we miss our opportunity. It will never be available to us again. And we have no idea when that moment comes. We don't know that when we disobey this and do our own thing, that that's going to set our lives on a path that we wish never was. We don't know that. That's why we have to obey everything God says. We don't know that when we disobey him that he will or will not give us another chance. Maybe he won't give us another chance. As you see, he said to them, he wept over the city. Well, we don't see many times Jesus weeping in the scripture. He wept when it came to Lazarus. We remember he wept here. I, I, I don't, I don't I, you know, in, in the garden. Okay, but we don't, we don't see many times where he wept. And I don't even think it tells us that he wept in the garden. You, you, you preachers remind me. I know that he sweated as drops of blood. He was praying so intensely. But he wept over the city because he knew the window is closed. You've missed your opportunity. You've missed your visitation. You've missed your purpose. God's purpose was for Israel to lead the world to salvation. They missed it. So he chose whosoever will. <laughs> whosoever will and that's you and that's me let us not miss our opportunity whenever God tells us to do something let us move and move then because a part of disobedience is our delaying God tells you to do something now and say oh well you know I, I'll get to it you know even the Proverbs said don't say tomorrow when you have it today 
So let us not miss our, our visitation. Let us not miss what God is wanting to do through our lives. Each one of us is precious to God and each one of us he has given a great mission to do in this world. Each one of us have an important role in this life. And so he has laid out the red carpet for each and every one of us. So let us go forth and do whatever it is that God has called us to do without negotiation, without arguing, and without hesitation or holding back. Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you for your leading. We thank you that we were here to receive it. We thank you, O oh Lord, that we can incorporate this word into our lives and do what it is that you have said to us to do. We thank you that we can look at this ancient text and make application to our lives today, that it has a meaning for us today. We learned about obedience and, you know, just these two disciples going without questioning and coming back and doing what Jesus said, that obedience, we, we can take that from any time. It doesn't matter how ancient it is, obedience is always still the best thing to do, oh God. And that we recognize you as king. It, it's not ancient, it's still for today. That we recognize you as king and master of our lives, O oh Lord. That you are the one who is in charge and in control. And that we give you all the praise. And, and that we still look to you to save us even after we have accepted you as savior. And, and, and we are what we are called saved and born again. We look for you to save us every day. We say, Hosanna! Glory to God in the highest, giving you praise, O oh God. And Lord, may it never be said of us that you wept over us because we missed our visitation. We missed our hour of opportunity. We missed the window that was open for us, that we missed the door that we were to walk through, O oh God. Help us, O oh Lord, to apply these things to our lives and know that you're the God who reigns so we give you every praise that there is nobody greater than you oh God and that we always will ask you to lead us to the cross that we may take it up and follow you wherever it is that you lead us this and all things we pray in the name of Jesus the Christ in that mighty and awesome and powerful name of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we all say amen.